Hello, and welcome to Heads Up, the weekly webcast and podcast of the National Headache Foundation. I'm Dr. Lindsay Weitzel, migraine strategist, founder of the Facebook group Migraine Nation and chronic daily migraine survivor. I am here today with Dr. Vincent Martin, MD. Hello, Dr. Martin. How are you? Good. Dr. Martin is the director of the Headache and Facial Pain Center at the University of Cincinnati. He is also the president of the National Headache Foundation. We are here today because it is Intracranial Hypertension Awareness Month, and we would like to bring attention to the fact that intracranial hypertension is related to headache. And we're going to talk today about uh, this, this disorder and what it does and how people with headache should learn about it. So Dr. Martin, let's start by talking about what intracranial hypertension is. Well, first of all, it's a very, very important topic. And uh, it's usually a, a situation where the spinal fluid, actually probably the spinal fluid volume, so the volume of spinal fluid. So everyone has spinal fluid in a sac surrounding the spinal cord and the brain. It's kind of like a shock absorber for the, for the brain and probably for the spinal cord. So it's this, this tube of, of fluid that's around these, those two structures. And when the volume of that goes up, and some, there may be a pressure-related component to it as well, then people can get certain types of symptoms that are characteristic of intracranial hypertension. Okay. So what causes intracranial hypertension? Well, that's kind of a, a little bit of a loaded question. Um, there can be some uh, fa factors that people have. So if a person is overweight, mm -hmm. um, then that might predispose them to raise their pressures. Mm -hmm. uh, there can be some rare instances where there are secondary causes of this, and you might get blockages in the channels the, of, of veins that drain the spinal mm -hmm. fluid. Those are called stenoses of the dural sinuses. Sometimes you can get blood clots in those veins that drain the spinal fluid um, and so forth. So there are a variety of different causes. When there's no, no specific cause found, other than maybe being overweight, it's called primary. And when there's a secondary cause like a blood clot or a, a blockage in, in the drainage of spinal fluid, that would be a secondary cause. Is that what uh, they refer to as idiopathic intracranial hypertension? Idiopathic just means there's no known cause. That would be a primary cause. So. Okay. Um, so what are the symptoms of, of intracranial hypertension? What does it feel like? What happens when someone has this? Well, the interesting thing is it pretty much mimics a, a migraine. So um, it, it's very, very difficult to distinguish a headache of intracranial hypertension from migraine. So consequently, the diagnosis can often be missed. Um, the headaches are often um, on both sides of the head. They can be behind the eyes. They can be in the back of the neck. They can be associated with nausea, sensitivity, light, noise. Hence, you can see that they have a lot of characteristics of migraine. But uh, there are a couple of differences. One is uh, the headaches tend to be worse when, when patients bend over, particularly if they uh, lean forward or really bend over far. Mm -hmm. They tend to be worse in the morning, oftentimes. They tend to be worse when you bear down, cough, sneeze, or with strenuous activity, sometimes that can bring on a headache um, as well. The headaches can also be associated with other symptoms, like they can, they can have uh, what we call vis visual obscurations. That means you can get blurred vision, maybe when you lean forward. In worst case scenario, you, you might lose your eyesight if it's left untreated. And then um, rarely you can get, or not rarely, you can also get ringing of the ears um, as a side effect as well. So it's not just headaches that, that, that occur with this, with this disorder. Okay. So then my next question was going to be, how do you tell the difference between migraine and intracranial hypertension when it comes to the head pain? And I think you pretty much answered it. The, there's a few differences like the bending forward that makes it worse. I think that a lot of people with migraine feel better lying down, and it seems like people with this disorder, it feels worse if they lie down. Am I mm -hmm. correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, so how is intracranial hypertension diagnosed? Well, the first thing is you need to see uh, the appropriate physician to make the diagnosis. Uh, sometimes uh, they'll present to an eye doctor because their, their vision is, is blurred or they're mm -hmm. having some visual loss. 
uh, that can present. Sometimes they can present with uh, daily headaches, um, chronic daily headaches, and present to a, um, a neurologist or headache specialist. Mm -hmm. The diagnosis is often made uh, when you look in the back of the eyes and you see swelling of the optic nerve. So that, that's that little scope that people put in the back of your eyes mm -hmm. to look for that. Um, and in, so, and then so that would be the first thing. And the second thing would be to get some imaging in the head to make sure there's not like some other cause for the swelling, like, you know, like a brain tumor or something, which does not happen very often, by the way. Um, and then once that's been, once those two, so if you have swelling in the optic nerve, the, the MRI is normal, then the next step is to do a, a lumbar puncture or spinal tap. And if the pressure of spinal fluid exceeds 25 centimeters, um, then that would meet the formal diagnostic criteria for intracranial hypertension. Okay. So my next question might be a little difficult, but I'm curious, in your experience, do people have to meet the strict criteria in order to experience pressure-related headache? Or do they sometimes experience pressure-related headache without meeting those criteria? Well, the, the criteria I list, listed were for intracranial hypertension mm -hmm. with, with what we call papilledema, which is which sw with swelling of the optic nerve is what we talked about before. Mm -hmm. There's also another um, diagnosis where the pressures are above 25 when you do the spinal tap but there's no swelling of the optic nerve. Okay. And in some cases, there's other findings on MRI that might suggest the diagnosis. And that's called the intracranial hypertension without papilledema or without swelling of the optic nerve. So that can happen. And then there's also another group where maybe the pressures are high normal and there's, it's kind of controversial in the headache field as to whether or not that those patients could also suffer from a more subtle form of intracranial hypertension. And and I will tell you this just anecdotally that some seem to respond to therapies uh, for intracranial hypertension when they meet all the other criteria. Maybe they have a few MRI findings and they have a high, high normal pressure, say between 20 and 25 um, okay. as well. But I will tell you that that's a very controversial topic right. within the headache field. Some headache clinics buy into that and some don't. Yep, that was a loaded question. <laughs> so uh, how is it treated? So you, now that you brought up therapy, therapies, what can you do for this? Well, one therapy, um, and the most common therapy, is a water pill, and the water pill is called acetazolamide, mm -hmm. and that's a one that has very specific side effects. You can get pins and needles of your fingertip, tip, fingertips. Rarely, you can get kidney stones, so you need to drink lots of water to keep your kidneys flushed out, so that does not happen. And then you can also get an acid buildup. So in my experience, I usually start off with, well, it depends on what the situation is. If I, if I think there's swelling of the optic nerve, then you have to go with a little bit higher doses because that's a situation where if you don't act quickly, sometimes there can be some visual loss. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, in, in many other patients that don't have that issue where, where visual loss or swelling of the optic nerve, you can start at very low doses and gradually uh, march your way up. You can also use other water pills, like there's one called aldactone, which is spironolactone and another one called uh, Lasix or furosemide that are sometimes used uh, as well in people that might not be tolerant of the acetazolamide. Now that's the medical therapy. Mm -hmm. Then if medical therapy fails, rarely, and I emphasize the word rarely, mm -hmm. uh, patients may uh, benefit from um, a shunt, which is where they put a little, uh, surgically put a tube in the, in the, usually it's placed in the ventricle, which is the large reservoir of spinal fluid within in the head, and then it drains into the abdomen. That's a, called a ventricular peritoneal shunt. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you that the shunts have a lot of complications. They kink, they, they mm -hmm. uh, malfunction, they over, over drain, they under drain. Sometimes the sinus, um, you know, the ventricles of spinal fluid will collapse in the brain and, and then the, the catheter doesn't work very well. So they're fraught with many complications. So I'd emphasize that really is, is one of the last resorts. And that would be primarily used to save eyesight if, if, if need be. Um, in addition, there are some people that will, you oftentimes will do another test called an MRV, which is an MRI of the veins. Mm -hmm. And if it looks like the, the two veins that drain spinal fluid, they're called the transverse sinuses, are both narrowed. There is some evidence to suggest if you put like a little metallic stent, it's like a little metal cylinder, much like you would put a stent in the heart to open up an artery, you can uh, put that in and open that up. And there's some people that believe that 
um, that that can reduce the pressures of spinal fluid as well if you open up one of the blockages. So um, that's called transverse sinus stenting. And that also is very controversial in the headache field and it does have some complications as well. So if you can get by with medical management, it's probably better right. than either the, the shunt or the transverse sinus uh, stenting. Um, I have another question. Do people with intracranial hypertension also often have migraine? Does that make it more confusing? Is it mixed? I think that's a great question um, because people say, well, you know, like some people will have high pressures and, and then they don't have any symptoms at all. So the question really becomes is to whether it's a two hit um, phenomenon. So for example, maybe someone has migraine or a migraine predisposition, mm -hmm. then maybe uh, they gain a little bit of weight, the spinal fluid pressures and or volumes go up, and then the headaches become more frequent and you get this gamish of, of some headaches that are migraine and some that are pressure related. In fact, in some of my more savvy patients, they can really even pick out what they believe to be their migraines versus their pressure-related headaches. Okay, all right. Is there anything else you'd like to add to our discussion on intracranial hypertension during this Awareness Month? Uh, sure, there are some predisposing factors uh, for mm -hmm. it besides being overweight. So mm -hmm. people who ingest too much vitamin A, so if they yep. take mega doses of vitamin A, that can actually cause some damage to those veins that drain the spinal fluid, and that can lead to uh, uh, intracranial hypertension. And then some other hormonal Im imbalances can also do it as well. And I've also seen people have had implants, like like, uh, like progestin implants, like Implanon and some other things that will develop, or even um, shots called Provera. They're like progesterone okay. shots for birth control, mm -hmm. where sometimes that has been associated with development of intracranial hypertension. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us for this episode of Heads Up. And please join us again next week. Bye-bye.